All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on the latest EUDR developments. Um, we still have a lot of people uh, registering and entering the, the webinar, but the first few minutes will be very much about introduction, so that's fine. Uh, I am Nicolas Pierre. I'm a sustainability specialist and country representative at Preferred by Nature, and I'm based in France, and I will act as a facilitator for today's uh, webinar. So you can see here uh, the topics we would like to cover uh, during the next 90 minutes. We will start with a refresher on the EUDR. This is a high level 15 minutes presentation to set the scene. And sure you want to go deeper in the topic, we have material available on our website uh, that can give you more insight. Um, then we'll cover some of the latest interpretations. These mainly come from the updated frequent, frequently asked questions document published by the commission. It is technical, sometimes complex, but this, this is exactly why we run the webinar, is to give you all the necessary information so that compliance with the regulation is possible from, far, from farms, forests levels, uh, all the way to operators and traders in the common market. And then uh, before we respond to some questions, uh, we will talk about how organizations can prepare for this piece of regulation and what is preferred by nature doing to support. Very briefly, and in case you, you're not familiar with who we are, uh, so we are a Danish based nonprofit organization with a global presence, uh, over 350 staff working in over 100 countries. Uh, Preferred by Nature has been working for now 30 years on supporting better land management and business practices uh, to the benefit of the people, environment, and climate. We, we do focus on forestry and agricultural sectors uh, from farm and from land use. Uh, all the way to the final consumers, and we have gained a, a very strong experience around due diligence based regulations and risk management. So that's very much in short, uh, and, and obviously we're happy if you want to engage and know more about us. Today, uh, you will hear from two prominent experts from our organization. Uh, we have Sandra uh, Razana Mandranto, our director for market and development, and also our commodity lead for COCO. Uh, Sandra is based in Ghana and oversees the development of our activities globally, as well as building key partnerships. Uh, she brings an extensive experience from the private sector, especially in the context of tropical agriculture and forestry, and she will cover the topic of how to get ready for the EUDR. Uh, before then, you will hear from David Hadley, our Regulatory Impact Program Director. He's based in Spain, and David leads the, uh, the department with the objective of ensuring our positive impact within the landscape of regulatory and compliance and um, policy compliance. Uh, David has been and is still involved in sustainability advisory uh, of forest impact commodities for our clients and partners. Having said that, uh, we have a large pool of experts in house and have identified individuals uh, leading on the topics and commodities relating to the EUDR. So some of them are present during this webinar and they will support, especially during the question and answer session right at the end. Um, they're also available if you'd like to engage with them at the later stage, and you can find the contacts on uh, our website. Um, now, just a few housekeeping information. Um, in case you have technical issues or problems with Tim's webinar, uh, please contact my colleague Monica. Uh, her email address is right at the bottom of the slide. Um, and just so you know, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, it can be published on our YouTube channel at, at the later stage. Um, the presentation slides, uh, they will be made available in an email uh, afterwards, uh, but not the Q&A part. And any comments or questions made by the participants today uh, will not be made publicly available. Uh, final points, uh, everyone here is in listen-only mode. It's more comfortable for uh, presenters. Um, you may ask questions in writing uh, via the chat function. Um, we will do all we can to answer as many questions as possible uh, during the Q&A session, but we expect to receive a lot, uh, so it will be hard to, to cover everything. Um, obviously, if you want, you can like questions in the chat, so uh, it'll push them further up in the agenda and try to, to cover them uh, at the end of this session. So uh, without further ado, I will now leave the floor to David uh, for the introduction to the EDR, followed by an update on the latest interpretation. OK, thanks, uh, Nico, for that introduction. And hello to everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this webinar. 
Uh, as per uh, Nicholas's introduction, the objective of the first part of this webinar is to really just to provide a high level refresher uh, on the main provisions of the uh, EU deforestation regulation. So diving straight in, uh, what is the status of the regulation as of today? Well, it entered into, entered into force on the 29th of June of last year, 2023, 20 days after its publication in the official journal of the EU. Most businesses must be in compliance with their obligations under the regulation as of the 30th, 30th of December 2024. That's 18 months from that June date. Uh, so even starting from last year, 18 months was not a long time. Now companies have just over 11 months. That's 244 business days uh, to be exact. What is the scope of the regulation as far as uh, commodities are concerned? Well, it covers wood, beef, uh, oil palm, soy, cocoa, coffee and rubber. Uh, these commodities are considered by the EU to have the highest importance and impact in relation to deforestation risk. Within each commodity, the regulation defines which products are in scope according to EU customs codes. Uh, so within the regulation, Annex 1 lists those relevant customs codes for each commodity, which means that by default, if there is a customs code which is not listed in the annex, then that product will be exempt from the regulation. So which products uh, are included? Whoops, uh, excuse me. Uh, so <clears throat> in the case of wood products, most products containing paper, cardboard, uh, most chip and fiber products or solid wood products uh, are included. The scope of products is wider uh, than that of the EU timber regulation including printed materials, that's all of chapter uh, 49, charcoal products and other miscellaneous products such as uh, tools, wood flour and certain types of seats. Uh, in the case of cattle, live uh, cattle are included, meat, offal and hides of various descriptions. For cocoa, the commodity includes cocoa beans, paste, cocoa butter, cocoa oils, powder and chocolate as a derivative. In the case of the coffee commodity, it includes coffee, coffee beans, uh, husks and substitutes containing coffee. And in the case of soy, soybeans, flour, meal, uh, flour, meal, soy, uh, oil uh, and other residues. And for natural rubber, we have, uh, uh, or for rubber, we have natural rubber, various forms of processed rubber, as well as tires, rubber gloves uh, and other articles of rubber. Finally, for palm oil, uh, palm oil in its different stages of refining, palm nuts and kernels and a range of uh, derivatives of palm oil uh, are also included. So uh, in terms of obligations under the regulation, uh, this presentation will focus on commercial organisations, in particular on two types of EU based entity uh, defined in the regulation. So those are operators and traders. By operators, uh, we mean an organization that places relevant products for the first time on the EU market in the course of a commercial activity or exports them from the EU market. Traders are defined as those businesses which supply, buy and sell products which are already affect, effectively already placed on the EU market for distribution, further processing or consumption. So this graphic just uh, expresses those two last two slides uh, visually. Operators may be uh, importers, uh, customs clearing and supplying products onto the EU market. They may be uh, domestic uh, entities placing relevant products onto the EU market that have been produced or harvested within the EU. Wood, for example, cattle, etc. Uh, operators may also be manufacturers. We often call those downstream operators. They're based in the EU itself, but they're placing new products on the EU market for the first time. And then finally, uh, exporters, I should say, uh, exporting from the EU uh, uh, relevant products. The blue there uh, would be potential traders within this simplified diagram. So what are the obligations on operators and traders? Operators must only place on the EU market or export from it products that are deforestation free 
and have been produced in accordance with the relevant legislation of the country of production. They must also have in place a due diligence system uh, to implement that prohibition. In other words, to avoid in their sourcing commodities or products which are associated with risks of deforestation or non-legal production. Finally, uh, all products which are placed on the market or exported must be covered by a due diligence statement, which is uh, linked to the import, export or sale of that product. Uh, and the submission of those due diligence statements uh, are into the information system, uh, which will be developed by the Commission, uh, effectively providing an assurance from the operator that the product is low risk in relation to deforestation and legally non-compliant uh, production. I should say that uh, in terms of the obligations of those downstream operators, those manufacturers, uh, that does depend on the size of the organization. So downstream operators, which are uh, also SMEs, small and medium enterprises, are not required to conduct due diligence for relevant products if that product was already uh, subject to due diligence and a due diligence statement was already submitted. However, they still must uh, receive those due diligence statement reference numbers and make those available to competent authorities on request. On the right hand side, downstream operators which are not SMEs, in other words, large downstream operators, uh, may also refer to those due diligence statements, but only have after having ascertained that the due diligence relating to the, the relevant products uh, has been conducted properly and in accordance with the regulation. In the case of traders, the, their obligations also depend on size. Traders, which are SMEs, are required to keep information uh, about their suppliers and customers and make, uh, and make really to support the traceability uh, elements of the, or requirements of the regulation. So they must collect information uh, on their buyers, their suppliers, including reference numbers of due diligence statements associated with the products that they're trading keep that information for five years and make it available to competent authorities on request. Interestingly, however, uh, traders which are not SMEs, in other words, large traders, are required to meet the same obligations as non-SME downstream operators. Uh, this is really important for larger companies, such as retailers, which are acting as traders. They will be required to, at a minimum, uh, ascertain and have confidence that the due diligence relating to the products that they're trading uh, was exercised uh, properly and in accordance with the regulation. We don't have time really to talk about the information system that the uh, Commission will develop, uh, so I, I won't talk about it, but I will leave this slide in the presentation that we share. Uh, it just provides an illustration of our understanding of how the information system, which is kind of more fully described in Article 31, uh, of the regulation, I think, or Article 33, I think I've put there, uh, will be in place. Uh, there's a lot more we can say on this, but unfortunately, uh, now we don't have time for that. I really want to move on to some key definitions which have wide ranging uh, implications uh, for operators. So Article 3 of the regulation requires that all products have to be deforestation free, but how is that defined? Well, it means that the products that contain or have been fed with or have been made using relevant commodities were produced on land that has not been subjected to deforestation after the 31st of December 2020. <clears throat> so uh, deforestation, the definition of forests, I should say, is the FAO one, land spanning more than half a hectare with trees uh, higher than five metres and a canopy cover of more than 10%. Uh, uh, deforestation, uh, is defined as the conversion of forest to agricultural use. Okay, so that means that uh, conversion of forest to other purposes, infrastructure, uh, mining, residential use, uh, is not covered by this regulation. For in the case of uh, forest degradation, uh, for wood products, the definition of deforestation free includes additionally that wood uh, has been harvested without causing forest degradation. Uh, this is another area where we don't really have time to kind of go into the specifics. The definition of forest degradation, as you can see here, uh, itself requires quite a bit of time to interpret, which we don't have time for now. 
suffice to say that all of the words in green are FAO or very close to FAO definitions. And basically that the concept of forest degradation is, uh, is really comprising the conversion of naturally regenerated forest to either plantations or other types of forest which have been predominantly established by planting. Uh, or the conversion of natural forests to forest which is severely graded to the point where it actually can't be classified as forest, it would be classified as other wooded land with a canopy cover of lower than 10%. Importantly, com commodities must also have been uh, legally produced as well. Uh, legality is defined as compliance with relevant legislation in the country of production. Uh, concerning the legal status of the area of production uh, in terms of eight categories of legislation, as you can see here. And this is a key feature of this regulation. It avoids prescriptive naming of specific laws or types of law. Rather, the regulation just defines eight broad sort of buckets or categories of, of legislation. So in the case of labour rights, for example, in the bottom left, uh, you would include in, in that category legal requirements for contracting or for work permits, obligatory insurances, uh, compliance with the minimum working age and a bunch of other uh, uh, sort of areas of law. And that would be the same for each of these categories. So the due diligence obligations of the regulation flow basically the, the basic steps of any company due diligence system with a, a kind of a major article uh, for each of these collection of information, Article 9, Risk Assessment, Article 10, and Risk Mitigation, Article 11. Uh, starting with Article 9, operators need to collect information, documents, and other data demonstrating that the relevant commodities uh, and products are deforestation free and have been legally produced. So this step is about collecting, obtaining different types of information with the purpose of using that information for the risk assessment. Uh, that type of information, as you can see, includes sort of basic information about the product or the commodity, the species, the country of production, but also verifiable uh, evidence that the operator can use to have confidence that that product is deforestation free. Uh, if you know anything about this regulation, you'll have heard uh, about the requirement to for supply chains relevant to uh, each product that's being placed on the market, the operator must obt obtain the geolocation as well as the date or time range of time range of production of the relevant commodities. The next two steps, Articles 10 and 11, deal with uh, risk assessments and mitigation. Operators need to analyze and uh, evaluate uh, risks of deforestation and legal non-compliance in their supply chains. Uh, those risk assessments need to be documented with justified conclusions, reviewed on an annual basis uh, and made available to competent authorities on request. The final step is obviously risk mitigation, where the operator has identified risks uh, at the forest or farm level. They must have in place controls and procedures to mitigate uh, or manage those risks. Those risk mitigation measures must have been uh, implemented prior to placing the product on the EU market or exporting it. And then just my final two slides, I think, the or three uh, on certification schemes. Obviously, the, the regulation recognizes that certification or, or third party verified schemes often represent best practice in relation to the forestry and agricultural sectors and uh, allows for these schemes to be used uh, for in the risk assessment uh, mitigation uh, processes. Uh, in other words, uh, yeah, in terms of helping to provide assurance, I guess, to the operator that risks of deforestation or legal non-compliance uh, have been addressed. However, there's no green lane. Uh, the uh, use of certification schemes shouldn't substitute the operator's responsibility as regards doing due diligence uh, in other words, they just you just can't assume that without any further work, uh, the products are going to be negligible risk, as the regulation uh, requires, just because they're certified. You need to evaluate the coverage and the credibility of the certification scheme.
Finally, the Commission will uh, provide a central database of risk assessments, or what they're calling country benchmarks. Uh, it will publish a, a three-tier list before the end of this year of low standard and, or high risk countries for deforestation based on uh, upcoming implementation, implementing regulations, uh, which are not developed yet. Uh, so unless a country is identified as low or high risk, it will be considered standard risk. In fact, all countries will start as uh, standard risk. Uh, and as I mentioned, th this list will be produced uh, to at least in its first uh, form before the end of this year. Why is that important? Because if operators are sourcing from countries that the Commission has designated as low risk, they will be allowed to conduct what the regulation calls simplified due diligence, which means mainly that uh, the operator uh, may uh, 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 conduct uh, 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 collecting of information uh, as per Article 9, or is, or is re still required to uh, implement the collecting of information, but is but they are uh, uh, dispensed from carrying out the second and third step of the due diligence process. In other words, the risk assessment and risk mitigation requirements. That said, even though a, an operator is sourcing from uh, low risk countries, uh, that geolocation uh, requirement as part of Article 9 does still apply. That concludes the first part of the webinar. Uh, so I will now just move on quickly to uh, the second part, which is just unpacking some of the latest interpretations. And I'm a little bit nervous because there's so much we can cover here uh, uh, and time is pressing. So uh, I'll just move uh, on straight away. What we're trying to do here is just raise a few topics for discussion, which uh, mostly come from the from key answers from within the Commission's uh, UDR frequently asked questions document. But we've also some included some common misconceptions, some questions which are often asked to prefer by nature by uh, clients and other stakeholders. Not all topics are going to be uh, relevant for everyone's situation, but hopefully some will be of interest to everyone. <clears throat> and just about the FAQ itself, uh, the Commission is now hosting uh, this FAQ on a special web page uh, within its green business website, uh, providing this and other resources to help companies and, and other stakeholders. Responses to questions are provided uh, by theme, as you can see. You can also download all the questions uh, as a PDF. They say that this, this document will be, uh, or this resource will be updated periodically. Uh, so what we are doing is uh, talking to the set of questions, the latest version is uh, version 1.2, published on the 22nd of December uh, of last year. There are, uh, there, there are 86 questions in total, uh, of, of which there were 26 new ones as of that version, but many of the other questions were quite heavily uh, revised as well. So, uh, yeah, what to say, uh, uh, a lot of the questions are kind of uh, quite helpful. Uh, and their welcome responses from the Commission. There's a lot out there that we feel that still has to be answered uh, and for which there's still a need for guidance, but a six out of 10 uh, so far for the for the effort. So, uh, and, and I guess like the, the last thing I would just say is that as a Commission document, we assume that the interpretations are official in nature, obviously, and are binding. However, we will be honest to say that some of the answers or responses do raise some ambiguities and even additional questions uh, that would be required for clarity. So uh, hopefully there will there will be ongoing uh, uh, updates of this of this FAQ. So for this uh, presentation, we've just tried to group the uh, questions into product and company scope, timeframes, geolocation data, and date or time range of, of production and, and others. So let's just move straight in. Question one, uh, what does the prefix X mean in front of customs codes? So if you see in Annex 1 of the regulation and the list of customs codes, which define the products which are in scope, uh, we're fre frequently asked what that X means in front of some of the, the CN codes. Uh, some, uh, some people have the misunderstanding that this means excluding. In actual fact, the prefix indicates that the product 
described in the annex is a, just an extract from all products that be, can be classified under that customs code. So a particular customs code may cover a range of products. The prefix X in front of it indicates that only a proportion of those products are included. An example would be uh, 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 4010 conveyor or transmission belts uh, made of vulcanized rubber. Without the X, both natural and synthetic rubber could be included. The X is really there just to narrow the scope to uh, clarify that it applies to natural rubber only. And just a small comment, if you look on the top right, you'll see numbers in blue. Uh, these are just the uh, main FAQ questions which uh, each topic uh, uh, relates to. So how is packaging included within the EU deforestation regulation? The FAQ provides an update, an update on this topic, uh, and I think it's quite important, so we brought a, a number of threads together. From Annex 1 and the text of the regulation, we are already able to infer the following points. Due diligence requirements apply to any product, sorry, any wood or paper packaging falling under an, an Annex 1 customs code, which is placed on the market or exported as a product in its own right. In other words, when packaging is traded as packaging, then due diligence requirements apply. Uh, the second point is that, however, wood packaging that would fall under CN code 4415 is exempted from the requirements of the regulation where it serves as packaging of another product. In other words, where it supports, protects or carries another product placed on the market, then it's exempt from uh, the regulation. But what about other types of packaging, paper, cardboard, etc.? So new interpretations uh, uh, within the FAQ address this point. Uh, any packaging, regardless of the customs code under which it falls, is excluded from the scope of the regulation, where it is supporting, protecting, or carrying another product placed on the market. So for example, customs code uh, 4819, for carton and paper uh, packaging would, uh, as long as it's serving as packaging, would, uh, would be exempt from the regulation. And the FAQ also includes, includes user manuals uh, as being non-relevant products uh, if they are accompanying a particular product. We need to make a clarification on the 30th of June 2025 deadline. There's a lot of misrepresentation in news articles, LinkedIn posts, et cetera, on who the extension applies to, uh, as described in Article 38 of the regulation. Uh, it's often uh, referred to as applying to SMEs or small micro enterprises. Neither of these are 100% strictly correct. So for clarification, the extension applies as follows to operators that were established as small or micro uh, enterprises uh, or undertakings before the 30th of December, 2020. These companies have until the 30th of June, 2025 to comply with the requirements of the regulation. Uh, so not SMEs, but small or micro undertakings established before the 30th of December, 2020. Secondly, it only applies as far as the text of the regulation is concerned to operators. I will note that the FAQ says that it applies to traders as well. That is something that we need clarification from, from the Commission to be sure that, that they've got that right. Uh, thirdly, the exemption applies to uh, all products in Annex 1 except those included within the scope of the EU timber regulation. So for EUTR products, the expectation is that all companies, regardless of size, will be able to be compliant uh, with those products by the 30th of December 2024. Okay, so it's a, it's a nuanced definition here that we're trying to communicate. Uh, moving on to questions of timeframes, compliance with requirements before the 30th of December 2024. Do products placed in the EU market or exported before or I should say between entry into force and the date of applic uh, applicability of the regulation. That's the 30th of December 2024 for most uh, companies. This is what I've put as the uh, transitional period in blue in the diagram. Uh, do they have to comply with the requirements of the regulation? Short answer, no. 
Uh, the regulation entered into force on uh, June last year. It enters into application, as I just mentioned, at the end of this year. In this transitional period between those two dates, products placed on the EU market do, or exported do not have to comply with the requirements of the regulation, which means no obligation to conduct due diligence, for example, no obligation to collect geolocation data, no obligation to submit due diligence statements. Five, products uh, placed on the market during the transitional, uh, or I should say already placed on the market during the transitional period. So we're turning our attention now to once the EUDR is applicable to businesses. What are the obligations for operators if they place on the EU market or export from it a product which is made of a relevant product or commodity which was already placed on the market during the transitional period, during that blue line? The answer is that you only need to gather or keep adequately conclusive and verifiable evidence to prove that that relevant product or commodity that was used to produce your product uh, was previously placed on the market before the entry into application of the regulation. A little bit complex, but in other words, you don't need to have done due diligence on that commodity or product that was already placed on the EU market. You only need to demonstrate that it was placed on the EU market during the transitional period. An example would be, let's say, just natural rubber. Uh, this is taken from the FAQ. A relevant commodity such as natural rubber is placed on the market during the transitional period. Let's say today, uh, it may or may not have been uh, geolocalized. That doesn't matter. It's then used to produce a relevant derived product, let's say car tires, which are placed on the market after the 30th of December 2024. So the the, you only need to demonstrate that the rubber uh, was placed on the market during the transitional period. You don't need to provide geolocation information uh, or have done due diligence on the rubber in this case. Moving on, I'm just aware of time. Uh, so uh, questions on geolocation, there's a number of these. The regulation requires the operators uh, uh, obtain geolocation coordinates of the plots of land where the commodities uh, were produced. That's we've already established. <clears throat> While this is not new information as such from the FAQ, the FAQ is really hammering home two messages. Firstly, that geolocation is necessary to demonstrate that there's no deforestation occurring in the areas of production. In other words, it's the expectation of the regulation that the operator employs the geolocation data which is obtained to assess that the land used for production is deforestation free. Secondly, the FAQ reminds us that geolocation, the geolocation coordinates uh, of all relevant plots of land be included in due diligence statements that the operators are required to submit into the information system ahead of placing on the market or exporting products. In summary, uh, the geolocation coordinates form a very core part of this regulation, which prohibits the placing uh, on the EU market or exporting any products where the geolocation coordinates have not been collected. So the key thing I'm, we're trying to impress here to hammer home is this is a really important element of compliance with the regulation. If you don't have the geolocation coordinates relevant to uh, the commodities which were uh, produced for your relevant products, then you need to obtain this information. Placing products on the EU market or exporting them without the geolocation coordinates would mean that those products were not in compliance with the regulation. However, uh, as if to assure us, the FAQ also seeks to, to highlight that collecting geolocation information uh, or coordinates of a plot of land is not net, is not does not have to be an expensive and technically resource uh, intensive exercise, that it is possible to obtain such coordinates via mobile phones, handheld uh, global satellite navigation systems uh, or devices which work with these uh, uh, GPS systems uh, and, and sort of other widespread uh, free to use digital applications. 
Uh, also, that in most cases, they, these uh, t these devices, these technologies don't even require mobile uh, network coverage, only just a solid signal like those provided by Galileo uh, or other GPS systems. We concur with this sentiment, but we would also, I think, qualify that from preferred by nature's perspective that collecting such data is not always so straightforward and cost free. Yes, uh, the technology to obtain geolocation information is, is generally available, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's easy and, and, and cost free. Uh, global navigation satellite systems are not always available, uh, or the signals, I should say, are not available under deep uh, forest cover or remote areas. Not all smallholders have smartphones, obviously. Uh, smartphone literacy is another uh, barrier. There may be underlying infrastructure needed to capture data and share it appropriately. There need to be logistical uh, processes uh, to uh, communicate uh, geolocation information. And there are often just other associated costs in implementing the collection process. Moving on with geolocation uh, topics, uh, what is required in relation to geolocation information? Are there differences between commodities? So geolocation just means the geographical location of each plot of land that was used to produce uh, the relevant commodities uh, by means of latitude and longitudinal coordinates. So in the case of all commodities except cattle, uh, that's at least one, one latitude and longitudinal point uh, for, the, for a plot of land below four hectares, as the regulation describes. Uh, however, for plots of land uh, larger than four hectares, geolocation means the use of polygons, that is sufficient latitude and longitudinal points to describe the perimeter of each plot of land. In the case of cattle, uh, the geolocation uh, requirements uh, refer to all of the establishments where the cattle were kept. Those may be temporary or permanent in nature and associated with raising the cattle. So that encompasses the birthplace, the farms where the cattle were fed, the grazing, uh, grazing lands and the slaughterhouses. The good news, I guess, is that establishments uh, can be described with a single geolocation point rather than a polygon. For live cattle, uh, the geolocation uh, would include all establishments where the cattle were kept, basically except uh, or minus the slaughterhouse. So in other words, uh, from birth up to the point of sale. Can polygons be provided as a circumference? Uh, no, short answer. It's not possible to provide the plot of land information as, for example, a single geolocation point and a radius of production around that. Uh, for plots of land more than four hectares, the geolocation has to be provided uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of polygons. Uh, declaring additional uh, origins, uh, in other words, plots of land that did not produce a commodity, is this permitted? So. Uh, this is something actually that's discussed quite a lot uh, among stakeholders. In essence, the regulation requires a correspondence between relevant commodities or products placed on the market and the geolocation of the plots of land where they were produced. However, an operator can, in some circumstances, provide geolocation coordinates for a number of plot of lands, which is higher than those for which the commodities uh, were produced. In that case, where the operator is declaring in excess, uh, in the due diligence statement, it must also assume full responsibility for compliance of all of those plots of land for which the geolocation is provided. In other words, if one geolocalized geo plot of land in the due diligence statement is not compliant, then that entire set of plots of land uh, would be non-compliant. Additionally, the operator must ensure it is carrying out full due diligence in relation to those articles 9, 10 and 11 for all plots of land declared and must be able to naturally provide evidence that the risk of non-compliance for all of those plots of land is low uh, with, with evidence to uh, back that up. A commonly asked question, 
addressing the FAQ, at least in part, relates to how operators obtain geolocation data where there are no property registers and or where the farmers, for instance, lack IDs or formal titles to their land. This is obviously a very common scenario in many countries around the world and of particular relevance on the topic of smallholders. So the FAQ tries to take this on by stating that, at least as regards the legality requirement, the UDR requires compliance with national laws. Uh, but that if farmers are legally allowed to farm and sell their product under national laws, then that would also mean that it is possible for operators to meet the legality requirement, we would assume at least in terms of land use rights, uh, when sourcing from those farmers. Also that uh, unless the uh, farmers are direct suppliers of the operators or the operators themselves, no personal information is required from farmers and that the geolocation of the land they cultivate is sufficient. That response speaks to some of these confidentiality concerns that have been raised in discussions uh, around uh, the regulation. So David, the last few yes. minutes, please. Gotcha. I'm on my last three. So uh, very quickly, a couple of final questions on geolocation related to operators uh, uh, and, and placing related to the reliance operators can place on uh, information provided by upstream actors. Uh, first one, uh, do non-SME operators and traders need to verify that the geolocation is correct? Short answer, yes. Uh, ensuring the truthfulness and precision of geolocation information is uh, a crucial aspect of their obligations. Providing incorrect geolocation details would constitute a breach of their obligations. Secondly, can the operator use the producer's geolocation data, presumably, rather than collecting it themselves? Uh, for sure, uh, simply that uh, they must keep in mind that they are resp ultimately responsible for its accuracy, not the producer who provides it. And what that means in practice is that, that the operator will have to guarantee that the area where the relevant commodity was produced has been correctly mapped uh, and that the geolocation corresponds to the correct plots of land. Last few questions. 13, uh, what is required in relation to date and time of production? And are there differences between commodities? So for uh, all commodities except cattle, the date of production is the harvesting, the date of harvesting of the commodities. The time range would be the period or duration of the production process. So in the case of timber, for example, uh, the duration of the relevant uh, harvesting operation. Key reminder here, time, date or time range of production is not required to be submitted as part of the due diligence statement. last two slides. How about in the case of cattle? Uh, well, the situation is that for relevant products other than live animals in the cattle commodity, the time uh, range of production refers to the lifetime of the animal, including the date of slaughtering. So our supposition is that for live cattle, that would include uh, the lifetime of the animal uh, except slaughtering. So in other words, up to the point of sale. I think uh, finally, a sort of a thorny topic around cattle feed. Uh, what are the general requirements for cattle feed? Uh, firstly, I guess to say our reading of the regulation is that uh, operators are required to include fat cattle feed within their due diligence system to ensure it's deforestation free. Uh, uh, the definition of deforestation free includes that cattle products have been fed with relevant commodities. Uh, in other words, the only exception that we identify in relation to cattle feed is that the geolocation information or that geolocation information in general for cattle feed is not required. OK, but still you may be required to present evidence to a competent authority uh, on uh, just the, on, on your cattle feed in general. But, you know, that could include origin information. I would just finalize with saying we uh, have noticed that there is no nothing in this in the regulation or in the FAQ that says that the date or time range information is not required either. We obviously would link date or time range information with geolocation information, but neither document is specific about exempting operators from uh, obtaining that information. So that's another question I think that we have for the Commission for clarification. And I'll stop there. Thank you.
Amazing. Thank you so much, David. Um, we all know how complex technical topics can be difficult to describe and interpret, and I believe you made a, a fantastic, jo fantastic job of it. Um, your time management is pretty solid as well. Um, so we will now hear from Sandra uh, on our recommendations to organization on how to prepare and engage for compliance with this piece of regulation. So these recommendations can be applicable to EU-based as well as uh, impacted organization outside of the uh, EU. Thank you so much and over to you, Sandra. Thank you, Nico. And thanks so much, David, for sharing this information. Uh, just checking, can you hear me well, first of all? Absolutely, yes. Good. All right, so there was lots of information shared. Uh, we hope that you're still with us because now we're going to tackle the last part of this uh, webinar, which is trying to present uh, solutions and tools for you uh, in order to uh, implement and prepare for the AUDR requirements. So um, why at Prefer by Nature, uh, we think we are confident that we are developing the right tools for you. Just, uh, just an introduction slide uh, as a reminder. Uh, in Prefer by Nature, we have uh, you know, experience from the, from the AUTR timber regulation over 10 years. Uh, from what we, have, uh, we were able to develop toolkits, we were monitoring, monitoring organization for AU. And uh, in addition to that, we're also working 30 years in responsible, with responsible supply chain. Uh, last year, we have organized about 25 uh, seminars and webinars on AUDR all around the world. Um, and, uh, and the countries we're working with uh, currently trade with Europe. So that was the introduction. Um, we have a suggested approach for organization to be able to comply. Uh, and what we recommend, and is of course to start now. Um, so basically, uh, what do you need to do for the next 12 months, or let's say 11 months? Uh, we've tried to present that in uh, with a time frame and with a stepwise approach. So starting first with understand the regulation, right? Uh, then moving on to investigate your level of compliance currently. From that, moving to a planning, an action plan, implementing the action plan and with an ongoing compliance. We are very aware that companies and organizations are uh, at a different stage of readiness, right? Uh, but that this is our suggested approach at Preferred by Nature. Just to go uh, slightly in details for each of those steps, understanding the regulation means what? Meaning that you need to understand what it means, uh, what are the, requ re, uh, the requirements, and determine if this regulation applies to you and at which level and how it applies to you. You may be indirectly impacted by the regulation. Once you've done that, you can start to investigate and compare uh, what your current uh, system, your current action, that activity with the regulation. So you can do gap analysis, you can benchmark the UDR with your system, we also in, uh, advise you at this stage to start engaging with certification schemes or with your upstream or downstream, downstream suppliers, with your buyers. Uh, the more proactive you are and the more transparent you are at this stage will also uh, uh, help your, your customers or buyers to be confident that they still want to work with you, right? So uh, try to understand at this stage what type of information you're missing and you need in order to be compliant uh, and what information you need to provide to your next uh, to your operator. Uh, try also to determine your exposure now to the risk of illegality or to the risk of uh, deforestation or forest degradation. Then once you've done that, uh, we advise you to uh, start your action plan, right? Start with an action plan make sure you allocate the right resource for this uh, in terms of human resources, but also financial resources, and make sure that you have your uh, top management on board so that there's no last minute surprise, you know, and that your action plan is validated. Then evaluate your options at this stage. Uh, what, what do you need to do to align your policies and procedures? Uh, you have already identified risks, so what mitigation measures you're planning to implement? How much you need to enforce your traceability system? Do you need to consider alternative uh, source uh, of, uh, you know, from countries or material at that stage? And how do you address the geolocation requirements? Once you've made your plan, 
it's time for implementation, right? So you need to develop your system or upgrade your system uh, and start working on this. And finally, when this is done, uh, you are supposed to reach that stage of ongoing compliance where you will focus more on, you know, monitoring activities, having a periodic uh, evaluation of the, your performance of your system, regular reporting, and make sure perhaps you also have, uh, you get support from certification or verification of your own operation to demonstrate your compliance. So this is what we are, uh, this is what we are um, advising on a, in a general uh, way. And as I said, you might think that you are at different stage of, of readiness right now. But what you need to understand here is what pieces of the, pus of the puzzle you are, you are missing and you need in order to get ready with the AUDR compliance. So, for instance, we have, um, you know, you can think that you need to enforce your public commitments. You need to enforce your due diligence procedures. Uh, do you, uh, are you confident you have a qualified team in place here? Have you identified and mapped all your supply chain? Do you have a full traceable supply chain in place? Do you think you have sufficient information for to do your risk assessment? Uh, are you today uh, in the in the level of uh, assessing your risk of legality or illegality, sorry, or deforestation? Uh, do you need to set mitigation measures? Do you need to report on your due diligence system? Or do you need to now have a performance uh, evaluation or, of, or evaluation of conformity? So you might want, you might identify you yourself here and, uh, and think which uh, pieces of the puzzle you need. I prefer by nature, we are trying to really adapt our solutions and tools to the needs of the industry. This is very important. And uh, what we've tried to do here is to summarize uh, what, which, um, uh, which uh, services and tools we have already prepared or in preparation that can be available for you, for your, for, for your um, AUDR conformity. So um, just so that you know, the majority of our tools, uh, not all, but the majority of our tools are available, actually free of charge, to be downloaded uh, on our website. Uh, Preferred by Nature is an open source uh, organization, as you know. So in the rest of my presentation, every time you will see this uh, logo, this icon, meaning that you can actually go in our website and download them, right? So um, what we're trying to offer as solutions for industries is, first of all, capacity building. We do have tailored uh, courses and expert courses. <clears throat> we are also developing an AUDR toolkit, either for setting up your system or benchmarking your system. We do have uh, tools for traceability support, uh, such as the transfer of, of geospatial data. Uh, I'm going to talk about this. What risk management tools do you have? Do we have? Uh, we, I'm going to talk about the sourcing hub as well as the third-party certification. And then finally, I'm going to end my presentation with uh, presenting you our preferred by nature certification uh, tailored tools. What to say? that can be used as gap analysis, benchmarking, or claims. So what I'm going to do now is go um, in details to each of those solutions. So let's start with capacity building. Um, so at Prefer by Nature, we do have a training a hub uh, where we have, uh, you know, we organize training courses uh, for where we have trained thousands of delegates so far. So you can, of course, vis visit them. Um, it can be online or face-to-face -face training, and we do have globally recognized training on UDR, FSC, legality, agriculture, ecosystem service, social auditing, etc. But now, for specifically for AUDR, we are going to uh, adapt our courses and focus more in developing modules on due diligence and uh, AUDR modules. So this is going to be uh, ready by this first uh, quarter. Um, that said, let's move to AUDR, AUDR toolkit. So, um, by nature, from the AUTR experience, we have developed the AUTR toolkit now mm -hmm. with a, a set of range of, uh, of, uh, of uh, guidance, uh, procedures, documents available on our website, and, uh, and also as well as our uh, legal source standard. So from this experience, we are adapting our toolkit specifically for the AUDR 
extending and ad adapting to the to the range of uh, legality and uh, and products and uh, with the aim of having a comprehensive set of templates and guides to support you in the implementation of the EUDR. So they can be used uh, to set up your system, but also to benchmark your current system. Uh, the toolkits we're developing are for due diligence, but also for land use, actually, which is very important. And uh, just so that you know, we've already developed a small checklist for uh, farm and, and uh, forest uh, at the producing level, if you are interested. Yeah. So let's move to traceability. Traceability is one of the topics that uh, we are hearing from you, and that is a uh, is, is a challenge because, uh, uh, as as we said earlier in the presentation, it's more or less easy to collect geolocation data. Right? Everybody with a smartphone can actually do it, but it's more uh, tricky to actually uh, aggregate them, uh, manage them, and pass them on through the supply chain. And as you know, if you cannot demonstrate the origin of your products, you cannot then demonstrate the legality of them and you cannot demonstrate that they are deforestation free. So traceability is a key topic. Um, and just as a reminder uh, from the regulation, uh, we need to demonstrate that uh, that the plot of land is geolocalized as a at, at, at a time and range of production. So, um, We've worked together with FAO and uh, and a couple of other organizations, which I actually uh, thank, uh, thank thanks so much for the collaboration here, to try to come up with uh, some kind of voluntary standards and rules on how to exchange geospatial point of polygon. Uh, and this aim basically to simplify the transfer of those geospatial data all along through the supply chain. So it's quite uh, IT oriented. Uh, this document, but it's basically to uh, for, for computer applications and devices to be able to communicate with each other, right, and share those uh, geospatial uh, data all along the supply chain. So again, if you visit our website and if you're very IT oriented, you can download this. Uh, in traceability, we are also uh, getting uh, inquiry from our, our partners uh, and clients to to support them in building up. Uh, their traceability standards. So this is an example for the rubber sector when we have uh, uh, come up with a, a standard uh, from smallholder to plantation. This uh, traceability standard is uh, uh, aligned with the AUDR and can be easily adjustable to other commodities as well. So, so it's again uh, free to, to download for your interest. Yeah, that was on traceability. And uh, let's move now to uh, to risk management. So risk management is a very important uh, part of your due diligence and to be able, for you to be able to assess that you are in compliance, right, with the AUDR uh, regulation. And uh, we do have a tool here, which is the sourcing hub. So some of you may already know it. The sourcing hub uh, basically is a tool that will help you uh, and will support you to make uh, to make your decision in your uh, you know in your identifying uh, in the identification of your supply chain. So basically, it's a, it's a platform that has global resource to understand what are the risk, the sustainability risk in the agriculture and in the forestry supply chain. So it contains uh, risk assessment data, and for which assess risk assessment data, it contains also risk mitigation uh, options. Uh, it contains also background information for each country with the associated key legislation and other tools. So uh, please feel free to, to, to visit this. Uh, with the AUDR now, we are uh, working on expanding uh, this uh, sourcing hub with all the forest impacted commodities, so the other commodities. Also in extended, expanding with the country, a number of country we covered. Uh, using our own sustainability framework to, to help uh, in the methodology and also ensuring that the risk mitigation options that we are proposing there are really tailored and relevant for each users. But of course, you know, those systems, as you understand, need also a real, uh, I mean, a regular updates to ensure that you have the last updates information. So what we are aiming to do uh, for this update and for this uh, ex expansion is to uh, align actually is to identify other organizations that that you know have a similar uh, uh, work set and prefer by nature 
and to join force so that we are uh, creating a collaborative uh, approach uh, with common methodology, common indicators to really expand the uh, risk assessment um, and to facilitate to this work, but also the funding of this work. So this is uh, an ongoing process for your information as well. Uh, yeah, that was for the for the sourcing hub. Um, for risk assessments, risk mitigation measures, we're also, of course, uh, uh, we have our third party certifications, right? So you have uh, you have certifications available. Uh, so just for your information to the right here or to your left, it depends. We have the uh, all the standards uh, that uh, Prefer by Nature is currently accredited to deliver. And um, so as a reminder, and as David say, again, certification is not a green lane to be able to be in conformity with the AUDR, right, that we know. However, in the regulation, it's clearly stated that it can be used as a risk assessment, even risk mitigation measure, right? So um, how can you use certification? Certification can be used for you to demonstrate that uh, your supply chain have avoid deforestation, avoid forest degradation, but also avoid uh, legal non-compliance and can be actually a great tool to also access some information all the way uh, to your supply chain, uh, like all the data transfer integrity, the geolocation and traceability data. So what we are advising for organizations that are uh, already uh, certified, for example, is to and also you know certified by your own standard we know that there's a lot of organizations out there that develop their own private standard so benchmark your standard against the AUDR uh, criteria identify any gaps if any and then address those gaps so that's the recommended approach uh, for a certified organization Okay, so I'm reaching now the final uh, part of my of my section, which is uh, the Preferred by Nature certification. So this is a tool that Preferred by Nature has developed uh, uh, a little bit similarly than what we have done with the with our legal source standards in response to the AUTR. So what is it? Uh, to simplify, the Preferred by Nature certification is uh, is a range of uh, of standard and documents with the core doc. doc Sorry, the core document, which is the sustainability framework. The sustainability framework is a standard which includes 46 indicators that are aligned with the AUDR, right? And it uh, it also works together with additional documents, such as the one uh, which have the system requirements with all the quality management aspects to be able to align with the AUDR. We also have a due diligence requirements document that has all the due diligence system and supply chain management, again, aligned with the UDR, and then the chain of custody and traceability, which includes also traceability requirements, again, aligned with AUDR. So all of this is available uh, if you're interested to know. So how can this work and how can you, you use this uh, sustainability framework or the preferred by nature certification? Um, it's actually, um, so to summarize, it's a tool which aims to facilitate decision making for operators, but also for other actors in the supply chain, right? So it can be applicable to any region or country, uh, adapted to any AUDR commodity. Uh, also, you can adapt it to any scales of operation and can be used at any uh, stage you are here on the supply chain. So either at the producing level, production level, or uh, can be used as a due diligence tool. Very importantly, it can come with a compliance statement if you're, of course, compliant, that you are, uh, your operations are compliant with the uh, AUDR indicators of the Preferred by Nature certification. And the tool is actually linked with the additional uh, tools uh, that I just presented, such as the Sourcing Hub, the Due Diligence to Toolkit, uh, as well to just uh, facilitate and link uh, all our tools together. So uh, we can summarize that it's a, it's a tailored tool, right? Uh, that can be used for different uh, in different approach in different way. You can either use it to benchmark your standard. You can use it as a gap analysis or internal monitoring tool. You know, for your to check the compliance of your own operation, or it can be used as a third party verification. Either you use all the forty six indicators, 
or you are just using the you using it as an add-on if you're already Rainforest Alliance certified, for example, or if you're already FSE certified. So um, yeah, I think that was my last slides. Uh, I want to thank you for listening, and uh, and I'm gonna hand it over to you, Nico. I guess uh, for Absolutely, the Q&A yes. se session. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sandra. Um, yeah, I, I hope it gives people uh, attending some pointers for their next step towards compliance uh, with the EUDR.